Welcome to Christ First Online. My name is Tiago, I'm the worship pastor here at Christ First Covina, and I wanna welcome you to our online experience. Before we get to today's service, I'd like to remind you all that you can submit a prayer request at any time by clicking the link in the description below or by going to christ-first.org slash prayer. If this is your first time experiencing our church, we would love it if you would fill out a connection card. We just wanna know that you joined us for our service today and it'll take you less than a minute to fill out. Click on the link in the description below or go to christ-first.org slash connect to fill out a connection card. Thanks again for joining us today and I hope you have a great time worshiping with us and hearing God's word. God. 
announcements to share with you today. We have community groups that meet on different days and at different times throughout the week to have deeper discussions about the week's sermon. If you're not already in a group and would like to give it a try, email us and we'll get you set up with a group that best fits your schedule. Our middle school and high school youth ministry meets on Zoom every Wednesday night at 6 for some fun activities and a great Bible lesson. If you're interested in trying it out, email our youth pastor Cameron and he'll be able to answer any questions you might have and he'll also be able to share with you the room ID and password. I want to take a moment to share with you what we've been doing on campus on Sunday mornings. We currently have an 8.50 a.m. classic service and 11 a.m. modern and Spanish services all taking place outdoors. For those of you with kiddos, we also have children's ministry environments for kids ages 3 to 5th grade. While we would love to see you in person on our campus on a Sunday morning, our goal is to continue to provide a quality online worship experience for those of you who aren't able to attend in person. Well, those are all the announcements that I have for you today. I'm going to give you about a minute to take care of anything you might need to take care of before we get into today's sermon. Take this time to fill out a connection card, submit a prayer request, or email us about youth ministry or community groups. You can also take a moment to pull up the sermon notes, which can be found in the description section. For a world of 
lost sinners once lay. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. I will clean. Morning Christ First, Pastor James here. Hey, as a church, we exist to equip every generation to reach their relational world for Christ. And I want to invite you to turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3 is where we're going to be. Now, understand this church, our church, is a gathering of broken, imperfect people including those who believe in Christ and those who, who don't. And the Bible is God's love letter to all of us. And we love him best when we seek to obey his teaching. And our spiritual growth is accelerated, lifelong friends cultivated, and community impact compounded in community groups and when we get involved and volunteer on a service team. And whether you join us in person or online, we, we want to invite you to get involved at our church. Get involved in a community group. Get involved in serving. Email us at, at office at christ-first.org. And we would be honored to help you get connected. Now, we celebrate every next step you take to, towards Jesus or uh, as you take growing up in Jesus, whether seemingly small or large. And I just want to say congratulations on your next step this week that you're going to take in Jesus. Now, this morning, we are skipping the first 12 verses of James chapter 3. We've been in this series in the book of James. It's called Work It Out, and we are in chapter 3. But we're going to skip the first 12 verses because if you remember, if you if you were here in January, I taught on that chunk of Scripture back on January 24th, which was actually the fourth week of our series titled, I Said This, You Heard That. And so this week, I encourage you, go back to our YouTube channel and re-listen to that sermon on January 24th to keep tracking seamlessly with the overall directional vision contained in this letter. So we're gonna jump in James chapter three, starting in verse 13. And it says this, "'Who is wise and understanding among you? "'By his good conduct, let him show his works "'in the meekness of wisdom. "'But if you have bitter jealousy "'and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let me ask you this. Are you a comparison shopper? Do you do the research to compare, you know, the differences between products so you can choose the best option? 
Speaking of comparison, that there was this old game show, and that's actually still on TV. It's called Let's Make a Deal. It was hosted by Monty Hall and is currently hosted by Wayne Brady. Now, the host can often offer three options to a contestant, a known item or cash amount, and they can choose between that or what's behind door number one or two and they would have to choose the best door to open without knowing what's behind the doors. Now, one door could be something worth, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, while the other door has something behind it that, you know, is pretty much worse, worthless. It's, it's called a zonk. Now, this morning, we're going to uh, do some comparison shopping with something behind two doors, but we're going to open up both doors and see what's behind them before we make our choice to choose them. And behind door number, number one is worldly wisdom, worldly wisdom. That's wisdom that's from below and how things play out as a result of choosing worldly wisdom. And then door number two, we're going to see wisdom that comes from above, wisdom that comes from God. And James is going to tell us this morning that many of us want door number two, but we're still making choices that reflect worldly wisdom and we're dealing with the results and the consequences of that. So let's jump in, follow along in the sermon notes. Number one is who is wise and understanding? Who is wise and understanding? And James begins with a question in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Can you tell someone is wise just by looking at them or by what they do for work or based on the grades they get in school? See, James, he, he doesn't care about all that stuff. You can be vastly successful or not, and this stuff can trip you up. What's most important to James is faith in action, and he wants to, in this passage, he wants to see wisdom in action. Arnold Palmer, he was one of the greatest professional golfers. He won 62 PGA Tour titles, and he learned golf and life wisdom from his dad who told the young Arnold this. He said, Arnold, you don't need to tell anybody how good you are. You show them how good you are. And that's exactly what James says in the second part of verse 13. He says this, by his conduct, let him, let who? Well, let he who is wise and understanding show his works in the meekness of wisdom. And that term meekness, it was used to describe a wild horse being tamed. So it's great strength, but great strength under control. Another way it was used was within debates where ideas, you know, they're exchanged back and forth without it getting heated and tempers flaring up. It was also used to describe an ointment used as medicine to heal for the benefit of of someone else. So in summary, meekness, as James is using it, is strength under control for the benefit of someone else. And then next, James describes worldly wisdom. And that's our second point is worldly wisdom. Verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, two ugly twins, these are both bad attitudes. Bitter jealousy is negative. It's a consuming craving for something you don't have. And James qualifies it with the word bitter. Bitter means harsh or unpleasant, pungent, even acidic. It tends to eat away from the inside. And it's kind of like trying to hurt someone else by drinking poison. It doesn't make sense. It only hurts yourself. But believe it or not, People do this to themselves, plus they tack on its twin of selfish ambition. Now, ambition in and of itself is working hard intentionally, and that isn't a bad thing, but it's not so good when it's a selfish ambition. That's a desire to have your needs met despite what others think or feel to the extent that it causes contentious strife or a rift in a relationship. It's getting your needs met, and you don't care who you have to step on. Selfish ambition lacks consideration for how, how others think or feel. And James goes on in verse 14. He says, do not boast and be false to the truth. Don't make arrogant statements, bragging about things to, to puff yourself up and to draw attention to yourself. 
And then don't be a liar. Don't be a liar to build yourself up. Just tell the truth. Be honest. Don't fall as well for false humility. False humility is, is arrogance, but it's arrogance disguised where one brags about their own humility or they falsely claim that they are helpless in order to get more attention. And then James goes on and shares three characteristics of worldly wisdom. Look in verse 15. It says, This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is, and here's the three, it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Earthly, think in contrast to, to heavenly wisdom. Heaven is, you know, this perfect place and earth is broken. Earthly is dishonorable. It's like placing your desires above your values and any morals that you have and that God calls you to have. Philippians 3.19, it says this, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, that's desires. And their glory is their shame with minds set on Paul uses the same term James says, set on earthly things. And then unspiritual. This is the word sensual in the King James Version. And it's very similar to earthly. It's relying completely on the humanistic qualities of your five senses and not trusting and looking to God for a breakthrough in whatever circumstance you're in. It's basically lowering yourself to acting like an animal and allowing all your desires in the moment to lead you instead of your rational, self-controlled, God-centered values. And then James uses the term demonic. James is painting this downward spiral from earthly down to unspiritual and then finally to demonic. C.S. Lewis, he wrote a fictional book called The Screwtape Letters. Screwtape was the name of a leader demon and he is writing to an underling demon named Wormwood. And they're exchanging ideas back and forth on how to influence us, us humans, to keep us away from God. And Screwtape says, he says this. He says, I don't think you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient in the dark. The fact that devils are comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in the patient's mind, and, and we are the patient, uh, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, therefore he cannot believe in you. You see, in the Western world, we can often dismiss demonic influence in our lives, but consider what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6. He said this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may, what, may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present, this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, listen, if you have a habit of choosing worldly wisdom, there's likely something unseen going on that's demonic, in nature. You need to pray fervently and ask others to pray over you. If it's a relationship issue, you need to pray for the one you are in conflict with and even pray with that person. I know the last thing you feel like doing is praying for the person you're in conflict with, but they're not the ultimate enemy. And, and, and that's exactly what the devil is trying to deceive you with, though to keep you away from that person and for you to think they are the ultimate enemy. Now, demonic influence, it seeks to draw you away from dependence upon God and to destroy you and your relationships. So stop worshiping your worldly anger and prayerfully worship God in the midst of your conflict. Even if you can't see a way forward, pray to the God who can make a way. If you continue in worldly wisdom, James warns that you will see two results. Disorder and every vile practice. Verse 16, it says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Disorder. There will be chaos. The way things were designed to be will be unraveled and cause disequilibrium in your life 
and in those around you. Things are not going to go as designed and it'll be undone in a chaotic fashion. If you've ever been involved in a family feud or, or a divorce, you know the level of disorder that can happen. And along with disorder, the selfishness mixed with demonic influence is given full vent. And you'll see this second result, which is every vile practice. See, anything that you can think of that's wicked takes place. The greed and selfishness of two business partners suing each other for every last penny in a malicious manner. Or two spouses, they pursue worldly wisdom and begin hating and resenting each other. And they pursue separation. They pursue impurity and vindictiveness and divorce. And the children are caught in the middle of it. They get hammered with the pain of seeing two people they look up to the most in life and their world just kind of melts down. And then the devil sits back, smiles, and applauds as they pursue every vile practice. Now James, he, he has a long list, but wants us to get our heads around what you're really saying yes to when you choose worldly wisdom over wisdom from God. So let's review that worldly wisdom list again. There's a lot on here, but it's so important that he wants us to get this and understand this. Worldly wisdom comes with bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. It's boastful and full of deception. And three characteristics of it is that it's earthly, it's unspiritual and demonic, and it results in disorder and every vile practice. Who would choose this list for their life? I hope you don't choose it. I hope you consider the consequences of your choice and not only how your choice impacts yourself, but the lives of those around you because you don't live in a vacuum. How you live your life impacts others. I hope you, as you comparison shop, that you choose what James lays out next, the wisdom that is from above. And this is what he says in verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So let's look at this. Let's break this down. First one is pure, pure. In the Greek, it's uh, M-E-N, not men, but main, M-E-N, main, which literally means truly or, or certainly or indeed, uh, no additives. It's, it's, it's just pure. And it's not men, but it's amen. You know, when we say amen, amen, brother, amen, sister, it's giving certainty in our hearts and minds. And you can find certainty in the wisdom that comes from above. And then it, you'll move into peace or shalom. See, everything is made whole and running in perfect harmony. It's absence of fear and anxiety, a sense of peace in your heart and in your relationships. Jesus said in John 20, 21, peace and be with you. And then we move on to gentle. Gentle is, is being patient with others and doing things in moderation. You're not brash. You're not rude or demanding. You don't speak evil of others. You're gentle. Not only gentle, but you're open to reason. See, you'll listen to what others have to say. You'll truly listen when your spouse has a concern and you won't dismiss their feelings. You'll value the opinion of others. You're teachable and you're open to pursuing a teacher. For many of you, that means you're open to getting a Christian counselor, for example, to help you reason through the conflict you have with yourself and with others. It's positioning your heart to be ready to obey. It's making yourself easy to be led. Well, let me ask you that question. Do you think you are easy to lead by others? And what's more important here is whether other people think you are easy to be led. So you need to ask others how they would answer that with regards to you. And then James goes on, full of mercy and good fruits, full of mercy and good fruits. Mercy is God's compassion to those that are guilty. 
What a gift. See, it's not giving them what they deserve. God's mercies are new every morning. So why not ask God to allow you to give mercy every morning to those in your life that don't deserve it, just like he does for you? Ask God to help you overlook an offense and to not keep score when they do something wrong. Mercy is a readiness to help others in trouble, but not just mercy, but other good fruits, James says. Other fruits, like Paul teaches on in the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is wisdom from above. And then James says impartial. We address that in chapter 2, the concept of being impartial. Whether someone is rich or poor, talented or not, old or young, believer or non-believer, born or unborn, you treat everyone with the same honor, dignity, and value before God. And then finally, he says sincere. This is, this is kind of a fun word. Uh, the, the English word sincere comes from two Latin words, sin, S-I-N-E, which means without, and then sera, C-E-R-A, which is wax, without wax. See, in the ancient world, pot makers, they would create their pots, and sometimes they would be formed with cracks in the pots. And they could easily cover up the cracks by melting and using wax and then paint over it. And nobody would know the difference when they paid for it, but they would find out quickly when they took that pot home and liquid would leak out through the cracks. But if the pot was genuine, without wax, because there were no, no cracks, you could stamp it with the words sin sera. Without wax means to relate to others without covering up, with no hypocrisy. You are authentic in what you are sharing. And it's always good to be a person that assumes others are being sincere with you, to lean towards trust versus suspicion, unless there is hard evidence that points otherwise. But listen, wisdom from above is sincere wisdom. And the outcome of wisdom from above, there's two outcomes. The first is a harvest of righteousness that is sown. And to be sowing something is, that's, that's a farming word to sow, which is to scatter seed for the purpose of growth. Imagine wheat fields just full of grain bursting with health and nutrition as they extend out towards the sun. A harvest of righteousness is a, a series of right choices that impacts a multitude of people. So we need to, and maybe you need to today, to repent, confess, and turn to God and turn in humility and sincerity to those God allows to cross your path. We often call those people your 8 to 15 or, or your oikos. as people who are far from God that God has placed you near so that you can sow this wisdom from above for the purpose of their spiritual growth and yours. And within all of this series of right choices, this abundant harvest of righteousness, you'll scatter to the lives of others. See, you are either planting heavenly or earthly seeds in the hearts of others. But make no mistake, you are planting something in everyone that you cross paths with. So why not work towards sowing a harvest of righteousness? And then the second result is peace. Is peace, an overwhelming sense of tranquility in your marriage, in your family, in your place of work, in your neighborhood. You don't feel like you're at war. It's like you're bringing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. It's like you have helped to bring yourself and others back to the Garden of Eden, walking and walking with God in the cool of the day. There is nothing to worry about when you walk with God. It's a taste of heaven before you get there. It's not wanting anything because you have more than everything in the presence of God. Have you ever walked in a massive green field and been enveloped by the quiet expanse of peace. It's an amazing moment to have. Have you ever relaxed at the edge of a lake, first thing in the morning, 
while it's quiet and there isn't a ripple upon the surface of the still water. See, this is what you will experience. This is what you will scatter to those around you when you choose to live your life intentionally based upon the wisdom from above. Listen to David in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I I have everything I need in my shepherd. And he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Shalom. And when you fully trust the Lord and make a series of right choices based upon wisdom from above, how wonderful do you sleep at night because you sleep in peace. Psalm 4, verse 8. It says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, you alone, O Lord, nothing else in the world but the Lord will get you this kind of peace. You alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And then you drift off into a restful sleep. So let's make a deal today. Let's make a deal. Would you like door number one, worldly wisdom, or door number two, wisdom from above? I would suggest we all want door number two. And let's review wisdom from above quickly. It is good conduct and meekness. And the the characteristics of it, it, it is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and other good fruits. It's impartial and sincere, without wax. And the outcome, a harvest of righteousness sown in peace. So how do you gain wisdom from above? Notice that James doesn't specifically say how to get this in our passage, but here are three ways that the Bible teaches to do so, to get wisdom from above. Number one is know God. Come to know God. Proverbs 9, 10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And this isn't knowing about God intellectually, but knowing God personally as your Savior and Lord. Will you get to know God today? It's as easy as ABC. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and choose to place your trust and faith, to place your life in the hands of your Lord and Savior, Jesus. And then number two, seek God's instruction. If you want to seek God's instruction diligently, read the Bible. It's his love letter to you. And pray and get involved at church where you learn more about his instructions to you. And then three, act accordingly. That's the difference between someone who is just a talker or someone who walks the talk. Live your beliefs. Live out the teachings of Jesus in your life. I want to encourage you, if you missed it, listen to last week's sermon because it expounds on this very thing. So I want to take a moment right now and give you a moment with your Lord to confess and to repent of pursuing worldly wisdom in your relationships. I want to encourage you, ask God to refresh you and then accept a renewed commitment to wisdom from above. So I want to give you a moment of silence to do business with the Lord, and then I'll close in prayer. Go ahead and pray. God, we come before you and we thank you. We thank you for your love letter to us that allows us to comparison shop between wisdom from you and wisdom from below. And Father, help us in our resolve to choose right, 
to make the right deal, to comparison shop with wisdom. And that starts by knowing you. And so, Father, I pray for anyone who doesn't have a relationship with you. I just beg you, God, that their hearts would be open to you and that they would come to place their trust and faith in you and seek to follow your instructions with regards to worldly wisdom and experience this incredible peace that passes all understanding, these green pastures, the still water, and the beautiful rest at night. So Lord, thank you for your word, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. to a time of offering in Galatians 6 verse 9 it says and let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up now if you've been struggling with tithing on a tight budget or if you have stopped tithing altogether because you have grown weary I just want to encourage you Start again and start as soon as you can. Even if you start with only a small percentage and work your way up it is still something and God knows when things get tough he does and that tithing isn't always easy. He never said it would be, but he also knows it works and that it blesses you on multiple levels and it supports his mission and leaves you better in the end. See, every week, I don't know if you know this, but every week in our emailed newsletter, it's called the E! News, you'll see our annual budget as a church and where we are with regards to giving. And lately, our giving has been hovering around 90% of our budget. And when you give to our general budget, you support every ministry that takes place at Christ First, and that impacts every generation. And I'm just so, I'm so grateful to God for his 90% provision. But you know what? I also know that we can do better than that if we all play our faithful and generous role in the body of Christ. See, for 124 years, Faithful givers have allowed the impact of our ministries to continue to shine the light of Christ into our community. And because of your continued and consistent generosity, listen, our church exists to take faith into the world. And it has done this. And, and this morning, Angelica Gonzalez was able to make a faith step and be baptized in her Spanish service. And I want to thank you because our church ministries exist because of your generosity as God leads you and you have changed a life through Angelica. So I want to thank you for giving. You can give in one of three ways. You can mail in your gift to the church office. You can take advantage of text to give or you can give online. Thank you for giving generously. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to bless you and to be a blessing, to sacrifice and to work hard even when we don't know, gosh, how are we going to be able to live on 90%? God, you have that way forward already. You're just wanting us to take a step of faith. And Father, thank you for the life change celebration in Angelica through baptism this morning, which is an outward expression of an inward belief and trust that she's placed in you. 
Father, thank you for using us in our generation to bring the light of the world to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for church here at Christ First Online. If you have elementary or preschool aged kids, we've produced videos just for them so that they can continue to learn about Jesus and grow in their faith. You can find those videos on our YouTube channel or just wait until the end of this video and click on the links on the screen. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week in Christ.